Hi there, welcome back to this fifth masterclass on thrombo and bonnet disease. A bit of change of tack here. Uh, this is a far more clinical and investigation uh, based uh, talk rather than some of the theory about why thrombotic and embolic disease develops. Uh, and in this particular uh, talk, we'll look at some of the uh, means of investigating for venous thromboembolism, looking at uh, risk scores, some of the tests that we would use to look for DVT and PE. Just like a few of the previous masterclasses, I'm pitching this relatively high up. So this is not really aimed at first and second year students, but perhaps using cases and some complexity that we see in clinical practice more for students who've been around the block a few times and are in their, in their clinical years and perhaps already seen people with DBTs and PEs of, of a more simple nature. I'll be focusing on two, two separate cases, one uh, uh, in of DVT in pregnancy and one picking up the case about an unprovoked DVT in uh, an otherwise fit man that we spoke about in a previous masterclass. Uh, this introductory slide here shows what we're, what we're dealing with here. This is uh, obviously a histological specimen looking at a branch of the pulmonary artery with a huge clot in it there over on the right and then you can see obviously uh, lung tissue and alveoli uh, over to the left. So this is a, a pulmonary embolism and uh, certainly working in acute medicine we see people with uh, confirmed or presumed pulmonary embolism most days at work so this is a big part of of, uh, of any general medical workload and as a general practitioner in the future you'll certainly be concerned that people will have had a pulmonary embolism and refer them to hospital for further tests. Um, as I say we're starting with a case that's perhaps not quite run of the mill. There are some things around investigating in pregnancy that always makes things more challenging and so if this is uh, uh, seemingly a bit above you then I would go back and start looking about standard investigations for people for VTE who, who are not pregnant. But this case it regards Lauren and she's 29. She's normally very fit and well. Uh, uh, she's uh, uh, para 1, gravida 3, had a couple of miscarriages and is 23 weeks pregnant when she sees a GP uh, with the sudden onset of a pleuritic style chest pain and for the last few days she's had uh, a swollen leg um, and so in terms of determining what we need to do we need to know what we would do for a standard patient but we would also need to know how we would modify the investigations for someone who's pregnant. So there's a few principles that we need to, to look over about investigating for venous thromboembolism. The, the first of these is uh, the use of scoring tests. Uh, and this is a way of taking relatively day-to-day -day variables and then calculating you know, what the, the chance is that somebody's either got a DVT or a PE. And a very well-known one is the Wells score. Um, you have to use these uh, you know in the right setting and some 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 scoring tests are not validated for things like pregnancy as well but we'll look at the wells score in a second um we'll also go on and talk about the use of, of the d-dimer you'll remember from the first master class in this series that d-dimer is a breakdown product of fibrin when uh when uh plasmin breaks it down from uh from crosslink fibrin to fibrinogen degradation products and d-dimers so these are this is a blood test that will go up when you've got clot in the circulation somewhere it's interesting to note however that it is not validated for use in pregnancy because it goes up in pregnancy in the absence of clot as well so not not a perfect test at all we then also need to think about what the most appropriate test is and we'll talk about the tests that we can use to diagnose pulmonary embolism in particular um, we've already mentioned in the previous uh, um, masterclass that ultrasound of the the, of the veins is the uh, the main test that you would use for looking for a DVT um, and in thinking about those tests we also need to consider uh, particularly what the radiation exposure is to patients um, it's an obligation as a doctor to consider the risks and benefits of an investigation and clearly uh, even things like chest x-rays but certainly as we'll come on to things like CT pulmonary angiograms uh, carry quite a, a decent amount of x-ray exposure for patients and we need to make sure that we're not doing those uh, willy-nilly. Um, uh, there's you know, the cumulative burden of having multiple CT scans uh, it's hard to predict exactly what that means for a patient but clearly the more x-ray we're uh, exposed to the more likely we are to have uh, potentially a, a, um, an x-ray associated malignancy in later life. So um, uh, we then would need to go on to select the most appropriate treatment and I'll be talking predominantly about the management of VTE in a completely different set of masterclasses on anticoagulation.
And finally, uh, and particularly pertinent to what we're saying here, the plan often has to change when you're pregnant. Uh, not least, you've got two people to consider in terms of x-ray exposure, but also two people to consider in terms of the profile of uh, the safety of the drugs that we would use and their relevance, particularly around the time of delivery as well. So I'm going back to the Wells criteria now. This, this slide's a bit hard to see, so I'm going to maximise it straight away. And um, you can find this um, online version of the Wells criteria for pulmonary embolism at the very good site, mdcart.com. The great thing about this, these sites is you can actually put the, the clinical parameters into the score and it will work it out for you and also then give you a, a risk stratification as well. Um, if you want to look over this in more detail, please go to the website or pause the slide here. But I'm just going to highlight a few, few points of note. You'll see that if you've got clinical signs or symptoms of a DVT uh, already, that will certainly bump up the chance of you having a PE. Similarly, if you've had a PE, if a PE seems to be the most likely diagnosis and you've got no, no sniff that something else is going on, like a pneumonia or a pneumothorax or musculoskeletal chest pain, then that also increases the score a lot. And perhaps not surprisingly, and certainly relevant <coughs> to um, the second case we'll come on to, is the presence or absence of malignancy is a significant risk factor for whether or not you would develop a pulmonary embolism. So I'll let you have a look over there at, at, at your own leisure. There's another other clinical parameters as well about whether uh, the heart rate's up, whether there's been periods of immobilization, um, and whether there's previously been a DVT in the past. Um, just before I move off the slide, and this is pre pretty hard to read, but when you've put in the scores, then MDCalc comes back with some risk stratifications for you that say whether it's low, medium, or high risk for a PE. And there's a number of different models in there, some of which actually um, trump the need for other tests like a D-dimer. Okay, so that brings us on to D-dimer. Uh, D-dimer uh, is a very common everyday test, and it's probably overused and certainly misinterpreted quite a lot. So it's important to know what the, the good points of, of a D-dimer test are and what its limitations are and know kind of when to gamble about when to do it. Uh, the danger of doing a test is that you're then duty bound to, in, to actually look at the result and interpret it and it can be difficult. So certainly sometimes D-dimers throw, um, throw us off the, the right diagnosis and certainly cause headaches in knowing how to interpret it. Um, First thing to say about the D-dimer test is it has high sensitivity. Now, one surefire way of losing students is to is to start talking about statistics, but I think it is important to know that just like the presence or absence of uh, a clinical sign, the the positivity or negativity of a test often give us different information. When something has high sensitivity, uh, it allows us to rule things out. So that's what the little silly diagram here is that snout, it says sensitivity helps you rule out. And by that, I mean, if you have a normal test, so if you've got a negative D-dimer, it's quite likely that the diagnosis is absent. So uh, a normal D-dimer means that a pulmonary embolism or DVT or some other VTE is actually quite unlikely. Having said that, it's not perfect, but you can say that if a D-dimer is normal in the right settings with low clinical parameters to suggest a pulmonary embolism, that that can help you rule out the diagnosis of, uh, of a PE or a DVT. The limitation with um, a D-dimer comes on uh, around its specificity. So this is the, um, the comparable statistical measure. And a, a, a test that is highly specific or a symptom that's highly specific allows you to be able to rule in the diagnosis. So if we look in a little bit more detail there, a uh, high specificity means that if the test is positive, then it's quite likely the diagnosis is present. The problem with having a low specificity means that when that test is positive, it could mean one of many different things. And in this case, a positive D-dimer can mean sepsis, it could just be pregnancy, cancer, bruising, clots and rust, you name it. Even just a, a trivial infection could sometimes put this up and time and time again, we'll have a positive D-dimer, go on and investigate and then find no evidence of, uh, of, of the thing we were looking for. So it's by no means rare at all. So low specificity is a problem with D-dimers with and lots of times people will see a positive D-dimer and automatically assume that somebody's had a VTE and that's the wrong, uh, the wrong thing to do. Um, it's important to consider uh, radiation dose when we're looking at further tests, so moving on from D-dimer. Um, in people such as, uh, as, as, as Lauren with pleuritic chest pain, we're almost certainly going to produce, um, 
want to do a chest x-ray. Uh, the good thing about chest x-ray is that it's a very small amount of radiation, um, but we still need to consider whether it's appropriate or not, particularly, of course, in pregnancy. But it is a very small amount of radiation compared to the more advanced tests below. However, there's also only a limited amount of information we can get. But if we did a chest x-ray and someone with pleuritic chest pain and there's quite obviously a pneumonia and that fits the story, it might mean that we don't necessarily need to go on and do more, um, uh, more advanced tests with higher degrees of radiation. The two tests that we do um, for uh, investigations of pulmonary emboli are a CT pulmonary angiogram and a VQ scan or a ventilation perfusion scan. Um, Taking the CT scan first, and particularly with relevance to pregnancy, so please, if you're not familiar with how we use this normally, uh, go back and look at that first. Um, the CT pulmonary angiogram is a very helpful test. It gives lots of anatomical detail, allows other diagnoses to be seen. But generally speaking, we often try and avoid it during pregnancy, and in particular, in late pregnancy and during periods of lactation when the breast is very mitotically active uh, and it's felt that that radiation to the chest is not is not is not uh, is not preferable often in pregnancy we'll do half of what's called a vq scan a ventilation perfusion scan and we will just do the perfusion scan as well um, this still involves radiation we're giving uh, a radionuclide uh, injection and so there is still an exposure both to mum and fetus that will that potentially uh, increases uh, malignancy risk and all of these things need to be very carefully discussed with um, the uh, with with the patient both a pregnant or not just to make sure that they're uh, happy and understand the the risk benefit of actually investigating in this way um, on CT scans, uh, there's, there's, this is an excellent series from the BMJ a few years back called uh, Too Much Medicine, and it showed an interesting phenomenon that's happening as we get more prone to investigating things. And the blue line at the top shows that uh, we're doing more and more CT scans and we're finding more and more pulmonary emboli. But interestingly, uh, despite all these CT scans, the mortality from uh, clots on the lung does not seem to be changing. This suggests that we may be finding clots that are not important in some patients. So again, we sometimes end up finding a disease that may not necessarily be a, a big threat. Uh, I don't know quite how this would necessarily change your day-to-day -day practice, but it's important to show that we find more clots, but it's not that more people are dying from them. So what are we gonna do with Lauren? Um, well, one of the options we could do is to try and spare her any x-ray at all and she's got a swollen leg and one of the best things might be to to actually just try and do a leg ultrasound in the first in the first instance because if we see that there's a dvt we may be happy not necessarily but we may be happy to presume that the symptoms are a pulmonary embolism too and spur her and the baby any further uh, radiation exposure Having said that, sometimes we end up doing both investigations, particularly if a leg ultrasound was equivocal or didn't find anything, and we were still um, sufficiently concerned that somebody might have a clot on the on the lungs. Um, finally, it's important to to state that whilst we we are intentionally concerned about radiation exposure to mother and baby. Uh, overall, the statistics do suggest that if there's a good reason to suggest someone has got a pulmonary embolism, that actually finding that and treating it is much uh, is much safer than leaving someone uh, who's got an undiagnosed pulmonary embolism that could then be a large one. And it certainly is a cause of, of, of perinatal um, uh, maternal mortality. Uh, if you want good uh, a bit more information on this, a uh, really fantastic guideline of the green top guidelines from the Royal Colleges uh, of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. These really are first class um, uh, guidance and it's got all of the information on how to manage uh, thromboembolic disease in pregnancy. And I would refer you to this because things do change and uh, uh, and the nuances of what we're describing here are, are quite subtle at times. And this has got full information around the overall risk of the different tests. So I would uh, exhort you to have a look at that. Um, Moving on to the second case, just to finish off with, and slightly shorter now. This, you may recall from the previous case, was um, from the previous masterclass, was a, uh, an old professor at uh, the medical school where I trained. And uh, they had had an unprovoked DVT a number of years before being diagnosed with uh, a malignancy. And this prothrombotic state that malignancy, even subclinical malignancy, uh, brings is, is an important consideration. So, should we investigate for occult? malignancy in adults with unprovoked VTE and you know what will that actually mean 
clearly what we don't want to do is be investigating everyone. So if somebody's got a provoked PE, they've been on a long haul flight, or they've got um, uh, you know, they've had a recent orthopedic surgery, or they were on the pill, perhaps they don't need any other tests. But it's worth always considering, should this person have any, any further tests to, to determine whether there's an underlying reason why they've got uh, a VTE. So uh, an unprovoked VTE, the NICE guidance asks us just to consider, it's a rather unhelpful verb um, in clinical practice, investigating for occult malignancy. Um, and some of this is going to just be simple things like an examination, um, a full blood count, making sure there's no suggestion of anemia or any other red flag things like uh, hypercalcemia, liver function tests, and in, in women of the, of, of the right age, perhaps uh, mammography as well. But sometimes it's sort of pushing us down the line about whether this actually means to do the rest of a CT, thorax, abdomen, pelvis, just screening for evidence of malignancy. Um, in practice, and certainly feedback from our local radiologists, is that there's a relatively low yield from this and we don't find many people with occult malignancy. And we have to think that uh, as well as the impact on a service, that's a lot of radiation for all these people to find very little sign of, um, uh, of occult malignancy. But it's certainly something we need to consider in, in, in the patients with unprovoked venous thromboemboli. So back to Lauren just for the last couple of minutes. Um, and uh, uh, she's back again, unfortunately. She's not having a good pregnancy at all. She comes in about two months later with a headache for a couple of weeks. She's a bit apathetic. She's even had some rather strange focal neurology, including a bit of dysphasia and some hemiplegic symptoms in her right arm, as well as visual disturbances. And um, in the spirit of all these masterclasses, to try and introduce a different type of thromboembolism for you. So you may not be aware of this, and I certainly wasn't as an undergraduate, but one of the differential diagnoses here is uh, something called uh, venous or dural sinus thrombosis. And this is a thrombosis uh, within the venous sinuses of the brain for obvious reasons. And when that happens, you get venous obstruction, infarction, raised intracranial pressure and focal brain damage. And it is something that's far more common to, in patients with pregnancy or with an underlying pro-thrombotic state. And in fact, people are on the pill as well. So it's not very common. And I have to say for the, the times that we uh, look uh, look for it we often find that there's no evidence of it but every now and again somebody with visual symptoms or headache uh, or, or um, the symptoms mentioned in Lauren's case will turn out to have uh, a venous sinus thrombosis and that can be managed in the same way as, uh, as other a venous thromboses as well. So that brings me to the end of this masterclass. Uh, make no apologies that this is relatively high level pitched at senior students and it's even relevant really once you've started work and I hope it introduces some of the the, um, the, the subtleties and complexities in managing uh, and investigating thromboembolic disease. In the final uh, talk, we're going to go on and uh, look just very briefly at inherited or congenital uh, prothrombotic states. Uh, and uh, so we'll see you, see you back then. Thank you very much.